Well, a top of the morning to you all. It is great to see you all here this morning. I also want to welcome those who are watching online with us this morning. Well, today we have uh, the final week of our series that we've entitled Good News. And we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, your devices, you might want to turn to there right now. What we're going to discover in this chapter, this chapter is filled It's filled with good news for those who have accepted and chosen to follow Jesus. This letter is to the Corinthians. It was written by Paul, who became a follower of Jesus when he was about 30 years of age. Now, Paul at this stage in writing, well, he's, he's, he's probably in the late 40s or early 50s when he writes this letter. And he has devoted his life with every ounce of his being to advancing God's kingdom. And in this chapter, Paul is going to highlight what we can expect as followers once we commit our lives to following Jesus, what we can expect to receive. And then he'll define our role as a follower of Jesus. Now, for Paul, he lived his life with the end in mind. You see, he understood that that this life is temporary, that we're just passing through, that our, our eternal reward far outweighs anything we'll experience in this life. So here we go, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. Paul says, For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven. Now, Paul starts off by describing our physical bodies, this side of eternity, as a tent. Now, early on in our marriage, Wendy and I, well, it was actually more I that thought that camping was going to be a good idea. Now, Wendy's idea of camping is staying in a hotel, but, you know, we were young and she humored me and, well, it was a disaster. You see, my first clue that there was a problem should have been the fact that we were the only ones at the campsite. At this point, I, I should have, we should have just turned the car around and headed home, but we didn't. We put the tent up. Actually, I put up the tent when he watched from inside the car because it was freezing cold. And then it started to rain like really hard. Now, that should have been my second clue that this was not camping weather, but we persevered. We got things set up and we're sitting in the tent and we're sheltered from the rain, and then in the distance, we hear a tornado siren. (laughs) Now, the next minute, this is a true story, the next minute, there's a stream of water like a river that's flowing through the middle of our tent. Now, I know some of you are asking, Graham, at, at that point, did you pack up and get in the car and head home? No, we didn't. We persevered. We were making memories together. <laughs> now, most of us understand. We understand. We need something more than a temporary structure to live in. You see, none of us were meant to live in a tent. We understand in this life when storms come. We understand what it feels like when we're, when we're hit with a tornado. And Paul says, we know, not we think or we hope. He says, we know, and here's the good news, that when we as believers, when we pass from this life, our bodies will be made new. We're going to receive a new permanent, secure dwelling place. He says, a resurrected body that will last for eternity. That's good news, isn't it? Verse 4, Paul goes on, while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. If we took the time, many of us could share the pain. This side of eternity can bring the physical, the emotional The emotional pain that our bodies are capable of experiencing. You see, that's why Jesus came. We were never meant to experience death and pain and suffering. That's the result of sin. 
Paul is reminding these Corinthians, and he reminds us here today that we as believers, oh, we have something so much better waiting for us, and that's the good news. Now, don't get me wrong, there's plenty for us to look forward to in this life, but our tents, our tents, our physical bodies are wearing out, and the older we get, the more groaning there is, amen? Verse 5. Now, now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose, what's the purpose? Is that we would receive a glorified body who has given us the spirit as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Paul says that as we wait for our new resurrected bodies, he says, don't forget we're not alone. We've been given the Holy Spirit who who dwells within us, guaranteeing what is to come. You know, when we find a house we want to buy, we will put earnest money down. The house is not yet ours to live in, but the earnest money guarantees someday we will. If you are here, you're watching online, and you've surrendered your life to following Jesus, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit dwells within you. He is our guarantee of what is to come, which is our resurrected eternal body. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us, change is inevitable. We all know what happens when we get married, right? Things change, right? All of a sudden, right, things have to match. You know, before we were married, it didn't matter what color the towels were, right? But when we get married, oh, it matters, right? You know, things have to start. They they smell better too, have you noticed? Now, here's the deal, that most of us men, we typically don't go shopping for scented candles. But listen, our wives do. You see, listen, when something beautiful comes into our life, things change. When the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he transforms us. His goal is to make us holy. Verse 8, Paul goes on, We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. You see, when we pass from this life, Paul tells us that we as believers will be present or at home with the Lord. There's not going to be a waiting period. We're not, going to, we're not going to be in limbo when we pass from this life. About five and a half years ago, when my dad passed away, my wife and I, we traveled back to Australia, and my family and I had the privilege of being there when my dad passed away. It was, I know this will sound strange, It was one of the highlights of my life. My dad had lived a good life. He was a godly man. And we knew as a family as we stood around that bed and we held hands. We knew as a family that when my dad breathed his last breath, that he was instantly in the presence of the Lord. Now, as followers of Jesus, when we breathe our last breath, the Bible says when we breathe our last breath this side of our eternity, that the next breath will be in the presence of the Lord. And then in verse 10, Paul tells us, at the appointed time, we will appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, this judgment is for believers, It's for those who have chosen to follow Jesus. It speaks of a time when we as believers will receive our rewards. It's an evaluation of what we've done in in the life that we've been given, this side of eternity. Now, Now, before we get too carried away, let's be clear. We're not, we're not going to be keeping our rewards. You, you see, when we, when we get to be in the presence of the Lord, we're going to cast our crowns before him. And then a thousand years after this judgment, the Bible says that there's going to be another judgment, the great white throne. You can read about it in Revelation chapter 20, and that will reveal who's in the, the Lamb's book of life. 
Paul continues in verse 11. He says, since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord and we try to persuade others. Paul says, since we're, we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, we should do as followers of Jesus all we can to persuade others to reason with them, that there would be a change in their heart towards the Lord, that others would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. Now, the Corinthians, well, they're far more concerned with their outward appearance than what was going on spiritually in their hearts. And the Corinthians, well, they look down on Paul. Verse 13, Paul says, If we are out of our mind, as some of you say, it is for God. If we are out, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. You see, the the Corinthians, they thought Paul was crazy. Why? Well, because he thanked God for the trials he had experienced. Who in their right mind would, would walk back into a city where they had just been stoned? Paul did. Who who would be willing to be in prison, beaten, receive death threats, shipwrecked, go without food because of the gospel? Well, Paul was willing to do all those things. Make no mistake. Paul's faith in Jesus Christ cost him. There were times when his life was literally on the line. But Paul, oh, he was able to see beyond his circumstances. So, so what motivated Paul to live this kind of life? Well, he tells us, verse 14, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. The most powerful force in this life is God's love. Paul says that the love that Jesus has for us compels us. It drives us forward. It motivates us. And understanding the love that Jesus has for him sends Paul out with laser focus. That's why Paul loved and served others, was willing to make sacrifices because he understood how much Jesus had done for him. Now, sometimes we as followers, we serve out of guilt or or we're trying to gain the approval of others. But that way of thinking will inevitably lead to disappointment and burnout. But when we serve in response to what Jesus has done for us, we're only concerned about what he thinks. You see, his love compels us forward. You know, I've observed over the years that, that people who love something rarely get burned out. For example, people who love golf. They, they love to play golf because they love the game. Their, their love for the game sustains them. It fuels them to get on the practice range. You see, Paul never got over the truth of Jesus' love for him. And even though Paul rejected Jesus earlier in his life, Jesus came to Paul full of love and grace, and the result was Paul's life was never the same. Verse 15, and he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Jesus' death means that we no longer live for ourselves, but we live to bring glory to God, to make him famous. Where to point others to him? You see, our natural tendency, my natural tendency is to, is to live our lives and to do what pleases me. And we can live for ourselves, or we can choose to, to live for Jesus. You know, we often think in our humanity is that we get all the things that we want. If we can just get those things that we want that we think will make us happy. Well, Paul says it's not about us anymore. It's about him. He says if we want to really live, then, then we'll live to please the Lord. Now, Jesus' death was a demonstration of his love for all people. But his death does not mean that all people will be saved. You see, God gives us 
He gives everyone in this world a choice to receive and follow him. God created us to live with him, for him. And when we live with Jesus, the Bible says that that's when we will find a truly satisfying life. Jesus expresses it this way in Matthew chapter 16, verse 25. It says, for for whoever wants to save his life, that means keep it for me, do all the things I want, will lose it, right? But Jesus says, whoever is willing to lose their life, that is give it away, surrender to, for me, Jesus says, will find it. Paul continues, verse 16. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Now remember, Paul had an encounter, before he had his encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He thought Jesus was a fraud. He thought he was a blasphemer. He thought that Jesus deserved to be crucified. But as Paul walked on that road to Damascus, he has an encounter with the resurrected Jesus And his life, oh, is transformed. You see, his mind, his opinion about Jesus has completely changed. He recognized that his assessment of who Jesus was was actually wrong. And Paul, in that moment, was reconciled to the law. Verse 17, therefore... If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. You know, Paul, he lived this verse out. He knew this better than anyone. You see, there was a time when when Paul wanted to eradicate Christianity. But after he was made new, he does everything he can to advance the kingdom. And being made new is available for all people. Paul says if anyone is in Christ, the if means there's a choice. The in Christ means that's when we're in relationship with Jesus. You see, it doesn't matter what your past is. If anyone is in Christ, is in relationship with Jesus, the Bible says that we are made new. That's good news, isn't it? And in order for us to be made new, we have to be in Christ. And you ask, well, how do we get to be in Christ? My wife, she has learned that if she gets rid of the outfits that she doesn't wear anymore, she's always always looking to buy something new. Now, her strategy is brilliant. She's always looking for something new. When we make the choice to put off doing life without Christ, and we put on living in relationship with Jesus, and we surrender to his ways, and we keep doing that over and over again, we are in Christ. We are a new creation. This is what we call regeneration. It's a rebirth, our spiritual birth. And God changes us from the inside out. You see, when we do that, we begin to see and hear things from God's perspective. We begin to seek what pleases Him in every area of our lives, our mind and our choices. And this transformed transformed work, oh, it's a lifelong journey, right? The Bible says that we can't be transformed through our own best efforts. It requires the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. So let me ask you a question. Are there any areas in your life that you want Jesus to change? I know I do. The good news is more than information. The Holy Spirit is the power to change us. You see, God wants to make all things new, all things new in our life, and that should be good news. For those of us who have experienced pain in the past, and we're wanting God to make something new, 
That's what, what Jesus wants to do when we're in relationship with him. He wants to make all things new. But, but Paul's not done. Verse 18, he says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us, that's us as followers of Jesus, the ministry of reconciliation. Now, this word reconciliation describes two people who move from hostility into friendship. When a couple resolves conflict or a disagreement, we say they've been reconciled. The Bible says there was a time when we, all of us, we thought that we could live without the Lord. None of us entered this world in relationship with the Lord. We, we were separated from God. Reconciliation describes that broken relationship with God between God and ourselves being restored. And this, Paul says, is from God. God is the only one that can complete this work in us. We can't earn it. We don't deserve it. And he is the only one that reconciles us to himself. Now, Paul doesn't stop there because as believers, we as followers of Jesus are, are to help others to be reconciled to God. Verse 19 that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. If you want to know what God's will for your life is, it's right here. He has committed us, that is God, has committed to us the message of reconciliation. You see, Jesus, he transforms us so that we can share the message of reconciliation with others. And this verse also tells us that God's not sitting up there in heaven keeping a record of all of our wrongs and our sins. That's the job of the great accuser. Now, there might be some people in your life that get historical on you, but Jesus doesn't. So how are we reconciled to God? Well, Paul just told us in that verse. When God chooses not to count our sins against us. You see, God, he's willing to forgive all of our sins. And that's good news, isn't it? Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, he says, God made you alive. You alive, that's us. He's talking about those who have committed their life. He made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins, all of our past sins, all of our present sins, and all of our future sins. Paul continues in verse 20. We are therefore, that's us, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul is saying that now we are reconciled with God. We're made right. Our relationship with God is made right. We are given a new role. We are now his ambassadors. Now, an ambassador is someone who is actually sent from a country to live as a representative in a foreign land. And you see, as believers, this world is not our permanent home. We're living in a foreign land. As ambassadors of Jesus, we're to live in such a way that we, we, we represent our king. We don't live to, to please the people we're sent to serve. We live to please the one who sent us. Verse 21, Paul continues, God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him, that's in Jesus, we might be the righteousness of God. Now, make no mistake, God doesn't turn a blind eye to our sin. The Bible says that the, the punishment for our sin is placed on Jesus. You see, a righteous judge must issue an appropriate level of justice based on the crime. If God overlooked our sin, then he wouldn't be a righteous judge. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And God cannot allow sin to go unpunished. Therefore, our sin must be punished. But Jesus says, I'll take the punishment for you. 
This is the great exchange right here. That's why it's good news. You see, Jesus takes the punishment for our sin and we receive the righteousness of Jesus. It's crazy. You see, God treated Jesus as if he was the sinner, even though he wasn't. And after we surrender our lives to following Jesus, not only are we forgiven all of our past sins, our present sins and future sins, but when God looks at us, he sees us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. And you say, well, I'm not good enough to receive that kind of love. And you're right. And I don't deserve it. And you're right again. You may be sitting here watching online and you feel unworthy to receive that gift. It's, here's the good news. Is that Jesus, he loves you. He died for you. Oh, good news today. Good news, one day, those who have chosen to follow Jesus will receive a resurrected body. Good news today, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee. He is with us, transforming us. When we pass from this life, we will be in his presence. Good news, we are being made new. Good news, Jesus paid the price for all of our sin, our past sins, our present sins. And God looks at us as if we were righteous. Now, we all have a choice. We all have a choice on how we respond. And two things that Paul wants us to do as we leave in a few minutes and head out into this world. First, be committed to the message of reconciliation. Our role is to help others come to know who Jesus is. Second, be committed to being his ambassador, his representative. As we get out and get into the parking lot and start driving our car, guess what? We're his ambassador. We're his representative. As we go to the store, as we go to our homes, as we go to our schools for our young people, whether we go, we are his ambassadors. We're representing the king. Go be his ambassador today. You know, in a few moments, we're going to celebrate with those who have chosen to respond to God's invitation by being baptized. It's going to be an incredible display of, of faith when people step forward and say, I'm choosing today, I'm choosing today to surrender my life to following Jesus and declaring publicly their faith in Jesus. But before they do that, and before we do that, let's pray. Oh, Father God, we just want to thank you so much for your love and your grace. We thank you for the invitation to be in relationship with you. Father, many of us in this room know that we have pursued after those things that have left us feeling empty. We've been reminded from your word that only as we walk in obedience to you will we be truly satisfied. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for the, the peace that comes in being in relationship with you. Lord, as we now celebrate these folks who are coming to, tell, to, to testify to their faith and commit to following you, we pray that you would bless them. And Father, their lives would be, they would become reconcilers and ambassadors for you and use them in a powerful way, we ask in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. amen.